Okay. Well, we are in session 11 of our review of the book of Genesis. And uh, it's in this particular case, we're going to be talking about Genesis chapter 6 and uh, the days of Noah. It may surprise you to see us out of 24 sessions spend a full session just on chapter 6. And there are some reasons I'm doing that. There are a number of places in the Bible where there are passages that are controversial. There are several different views. And what we try to do is present the different views so you can do your own homework and come to your own conclusion. And we'll do that this time. But I want to mention something that's different about this particular chapter because I'm going to suggest to you that nine out of ten pastors are confused about Genesis chapter 6. And so we're going to move into an area that's kind of technical in some respects. I used to regard it as just a, a, a peripheral, kind of interesting, but peripheral issue. But as the years have gone by, and as I've done more research, I was startled to discover that understanding this chapter is foundational to understanding most of the Old Testament, as well as prophecy. It's not just a part of the misty chapters of early Genesis. It is very foundational to understanding the rest of the Bible. So we're going to, we're going to focus on this. And I want to remind you what Edmund Spencer said. We, we bring this up every once in a while. There is a principle which is a bar against all information. It's a proof against all argument. Which, and which cannot fail to keep man in everlasting ignorance. That principle is condemnation before investigation. What I'm going to ask you to do as we go into this session tonight is to set aside whatever you may have been taught or whatever you believe uh, uh, about chapter 6 and try to look at it with fresh eyes and try to hear what the text is saying. And my goal is not to sell you a particular view. My goal is to equip you to do your own homework, to do your own digging, and come to your own conclusions. So uh, the, the same concept is in Proverbs 18.13. He that answereth a matter before he heareth it is a folly and a shame unto him. So set aside what prejudices you may have about these strange things that are going to go on in chapter 6 of Genesis. And let's try to op approach it openly and uh, uh, with an inquiring mind. And uh, what I used to do all the time... Uh, is always have you put at the top of your notepad my trademark, Acts 17.11. And that's where Luke tells you, don't believe anything Chuck Missler tells you, but receive the word of God with all openness of mind, yet search the scriptures daily to prove where those things be so. And I, I use that, I, for 30 years I've used that as a, as a trademark, and it applies no more emphatically than it does here. So we're going to talk about the biblical view of the days of Noah, that's a phrase that Jesus used, and we want to understand what it really meant. You may recall that four disciples came to Jesus privately. Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, Peter's brother, came to Jesus. He happened to be sitting on the Mount of Olives, so many people call his response to their questions the Olivet Discourse. And it's recorded in, uh, in, in uh, uh, three places, Matthew 24 and 25, Mark 13, and Luke 21 and 22. And uh, we'll t look at the Matthew account. Since Matthew took shorthand, he had to. He was a, ta a tax customs official. That was a re job requirement. Uh, he, his, his gospel uh, it has most of these taken down in verbatim. But in that discussion that Jesus, in responding to their question about his second coming, he opened his discussion and he closed his discussion, two-chapter discussion, with the admonition, take heed that no man deceive you. So you want to have your, your guard up on this one. But when you get down to verse 37 of Matthew 24, Jesus makes an interesting remark. He says, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The whole passage has to do with his second coming. And uh, this is Matthew 24. In a couple of chapters, he's going to be crucified. He's got, he, that, and that crucifixion was not a tragedy. It was an achievement. 
the, the details of which were laid down in Genesis 3, and the entire Bible focuses on that cross. But as he's preparing his disciples for his departure and reminding them that he is coming back and talking the details about his second coming, among the things he remarks, he refers to the days of Noah. And uh, what we, want, we don't understand what he's talking about because most of us don't have any idea. We have no idea what the days of Noah were really like. Well, it was a day of great sinfulness. Indeed, it was. But if that's all there was, we better get some life jackets. Right? Okay. So what does that mean as part of the question? Well, we're going to explore. Genesis chapter 6 is preparatory to the ark and the flood and all of that. Most of us know all of How many of you know about Noah? Oh, you've heard of Noah before? About 80%. Oh? Hmm. Okay. I'm kidding, of course, but... The ark and all of that will be chapter 7, 8, and 9. 7 and 8, actually, and then 9 at the end of it. So we're going to focus, though, on chapter 6 tonight, particularly, because we need to understand that because there are some conditions that will impact your understanding of almost everything else in the Old Testament and also, and thus, the prophecies. So Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Now, the first thing I want you to notice before we get in this I want you to notice verse 1 and 2 are a single sentence. It's amazing how much confusion has been generated by splitting that single sentence into the two verses. Genesis 6, verse 1 and 2. It came to pass when men began, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. Well, the first thing it hits us is, sons of God. What does that phrase really mean? The sons of God. You want you to notice when men began to multiply, that's men in general. No particular subset. Well, just men multiplied on the face of the earth, and they had daughters. We're talking daughters in general. We're not talking about a specific group of daughters. We're born of them. That the sons of God, whoever they were, we'll come back to that, saw the daughters of men that they were fair, they were attractive. I assume that was a general attribution. And they took them wives of all which they chose. That's kind of a strange phrase, by the way. In the Hebrew especially, it implies that they just, the wives didn't have much choice about it. They took them wives of all which they chose. And uh, so now, what about this word, Sons of God. In the Hebrew, it's Bnei ha Elohim, ha Elohim, sons of God. But it's a phrase to understand what it means. We need to examine the rest of the Bible, and you'll discover something interesting. That phrase is used of a direct creation of God. Okay, what did that include? Adam was a son of God. He was a direct creation of God. He fell, become sinful. You and I as natural born sons and daughters, are sons and daughters of Adam in the natural. We, are, we, we have a genetic defect that's called sin. Therefore, we die. Well, babies are, in, are innocent. No, they die also. See, there's, even though they may be uh, 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 given certain um, allowances by God until they get the age of accountability, they also have a genetic defect called sin. We're sons of Adam, not sons of God. The term son of God in the scripture is always used of a direct creation of God. That includes Adam and it includes the angels. In fact, that particular phrase, if you search the entire Old Testament in the Hebrew, it's always used of angels. There are some similar passages used slightly differently, but that particular term uh, we maintain is a technical term referring to angels. Now I might mention something so you don't get confused. When you get to the Gospel of John, 1 John 11 and 12, speaking of Jesus Christ, he came unto his own, Israel, but his own received him not. But as many as did receive him, to them gave he the power to be what? Become the sons of God. And of life through his name. So the, the point is, that's why, that, and that gets explained in John chapter, that's in John 1. John 3, he explains it. There is a new birth involved. That's not a figure of speech. There's actually a creative event that takes place. 
when you receive Jesus Christ. That's why it's called a new birth. And that's why you are a new creature. You are then a direct creation of God if you're a believer. And those aren't just idioms of, of, of spiritual philosophy or something. They are very, very real events. And if it happens, your life will be changed after that. It'll, have, it'll bear fruit. If there's no fruit, then you've got a problem. But let's move on. So the, the sons of God re refer to angels. Well, this leads then to a pretty weird set of views about this chapter. They are views that are not taught in most seminaries. I remember when we published uh, uh, our, some of our books and stuff, I got calls from vice presidents of major publishing companies that were angry, not at me, but to realize that they'd graduated from seminary, in this particular case, and had never been even taught this view. It's not like, here's, I'm going to show you both views in a minute, but there's two views. These are the two views. Take your pick. Most people had never been taught or taken seriously the view I'm going to show you. The sons of God, B'nai HaElohim, it always is used of angels in the Old Testament. In Job three times, Job 1, 6, 2, 1, and 38, 7. In Luke uh, uh, 20, verse 36 is the equivalent uh, uh, emphasis. There's a book called the Book of Enoch. It's not part of the Bible. It's not regarded as an authentic source. It is named after what may have been at one time an authentic source that's been lost, but it's a collection of views. But it's a very valuable book. It emerged about the second century before Christ, and what makes it valuable is not its content because it's not inspired, but it's very useful for grammar and vocabulary because it's Hebrew two centuries before Christ, and it deals with these issues. And, and it details this kind of thing. And so don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting the Book of Enoch is inspired literature. I am saying it's a useful reference point to understand the grammar and the vocabulary of that day. But even more so is the Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. Three centuries before Christ's ministry, the Hebrew scriptures were translated into Greek. And we have four copies of that. That the, the, it's called the Septuagint, a fancy word for 70. 70 scholars were gathered in the center, literary center of the world called Alexandria in Egypt and uh, spent 15 years from 285 to 270 translating the Old Testament into Greek. Now what makes that so valuable is Greek is a very precise language. Incredibly, probably no language has ever come along as, as, pro, as precise as Greek. Every verb has to fit five conditions and so forth. In the Septuagint, uh, the Septuagint translates this clearly as angels. And now it was done by the greatest Hebrew scholars three centuries before Christ's birth. So I'm going to suggest that, that at least in some of these cases, it's very authoritative. Now, it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born of them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. And now we get to, uh, we, we talked about Benai HaElohim, sons of God. The daughters of men, I want you to notice what that is, Banath Adam in the Hebrew. The view that is taught by many, most seminaries is that, well, that really refers to the daughters of Cain. And they try to create a situation that the sons of God referred to the descendants of Seth and the, the, the daughters were of Cain and they weren't supposed to intermarry and that's what's involved here. I'll deal with that in more detail in a minute, but I want you to notice that's not what the text says. Is the sons of God, Benai Elohim, saw the Banath Adam, that is the daughters of Adam. So these are general girls, not a girls of a particular, of either of Cain or Abel or Seth or whatever. Are you with me? Okay. Now when you get down to verse 4, it says there were Nephilim in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children unto them. The same became the Hagibarim, the mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. There were Nephilim. That's the Hebrew word. Unfortunately, it's translated as giants in many English translations. They did happen to be giants, but that's not what the word means. The word in the Hebrew is Nephilim. And uh, it's important to understand this word. It comes from a root meaning nephal, the fallen ones. The, the, the verb nephal in the Hebrew is to fall or be cast down, to fall away or desert. If you're a deserter or if you, you, you uh, so forth, you're a, uh, the verb is nephal. 
Nephilim are the fallen ones. So there were fallen ones. Now what on earth are they? Also in that verse was the Hagibarim, the mighty ones. And this, these Nephilim, in other words, when these angels, now these are fallen angels, these are bad guys, you'll see in a minute. When they found some way to procreate with women, human women, they gave birth to hybrids. They were different than either of their parents because they were part human and part not human. And these were the Nephilim. And this idea shocks many people. It's very disturbing to many people, but let's try to keep an open mind and see what the scripture says and see what implications it has in our understanding, not just of the flood of Noah, but the rest of the Old Testament. Now, again, the Septuagint takes this word, uh, Nephilim, and treats it, uh, translated as gigantes. Because it's gigantes, when they translated from the Septuagint to the English, they called them giants. It sounded like giants. That's not what the word means, by the way, but you can understand why they did that. That's, they really transliterated. So they translated in most English Bibles as giants. The word from, comes from gigas, which means earthborn. And it's the same word that they use in Greek mythology for titans. Titans in Greek mythology were the, were the uh, offspring of, of gods, uh, Greek gods, cohabiting with women. They were the demigods, half god, half man. Titans, Atlas, Hercules, these were in mythology, these kinds of creatures. So that's what the word is the word, uh, used for. The word genea means to breed uh, and or be of a certain kind. And uh, the English word genes or genetics comes from the same Greek root. And there may be a linkage here that may surprise you that we'll get into this a little bit. Well, Genesis 3 said, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. So from this announcement, there's 120 years before the big event, which we'll talk about. And then verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days. That's the, way it'd be, that's the way it would be in your Bible. The word is Nephilim. We're going to talk a lot about Nephilim in the earth in those days. And, also, and notice this. And also after that, these things occurred in those days, and they gave rise to the flood. But there's a phrase in here we're going to, re, we're going to come back to later. And also after that, it didn't end with the flood. It was so universal that the flood dealt with it. But we're going to discover it wasn't limited to that. There's been some incidents since then. Anyway, and they, when the sons of God, the Baniah Elohim, came in unto the, the Benoth Adam, and they bare children unto them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. Now, when you get down to verse 9, we're going to be dealing with some other verses here in a minute, but I want to, give you, I want to look ahead a little bit. In verse 9 of chapter 6, there is a remark about Noah that unless you're very careful, unless you have do some exegetical homework, you won't, you'll miss the meaning of it. It says, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Now, here's that phrase again. We ran into that phrase um, with Enoch, didn't we? Noah walked with God. Uh, he was a just man. That doesn't, doesn't mean he was sinless, but it does mean he was... Uh, uh, he was righteous before God because he was faithful and obedient. But there's a phrase in here that most people miss. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Now that word perfect in the Hebrew is tamim. It always refers to a physical blemish. It, tamim means without a blemish. Sound, healthful, without spot. Unblemished, in other words. Unimpaired. Well, wait a minute. What does it mean when it says that his genealogy was unimpaired? You see, it wasn't tainted by this, 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 these, these goings-on with these fallen angels. The human race was getting contaminated. In fact, I believe it was Satan's strategy to contaminate the human race to prevent a redeemer that was promised in Genesis 3. But Noah is an exception. He may not have been the only exception, but what was distinctive with Noah and his gang is that they were untainted by these goings-on of the Nephilim, I mean, of the, uh, of the fallen angels. Now you say, gee, this, this sounds pretty weird stuff, Chuck. You're saying that these angels 
cohabited with women and gave birth to hybrids. Well, if that's a pretty weird idea. But if it's true, it's going to be confirmed in at least two places elsewhere in the Bible, right? Two or three witnesses, this, the, the law requires. If you turn to Jude, verse 6 and 7, that's the, chapter, that's the book just before the book of Revelation in the New Testament. Jude is making an argument that I'm not going to try to recreate here to take the time, but in, it is, he makes, in his argument, he makes reference in verse 6 of this little book. He says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of that great day. So Jude here, Jude's the brother of Jesus Christ. He's writing this little short epistle. He's speaking of angels that did something wrong. They, left their, they, they kept not their first estate, but they left their own habitation. I'll come back to that word in a minute. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of their great day. Then he goes on to amplify this for us in, the, in verse 7. He says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth an example, for an, for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So here we have an allusion by Jude that these angels, which apparently went after strange flesh, which God, because of that, they are reserved in everlasting chains and under darkness. So they're, they're, they're given a very special treatment. Well, this left their own habitation going after strange flesh. These are angels he's talking about here. The word habitation, here's another technicality. You'll find, uh, you, you, you won't find this uh, in most uh, textbooks, but let me just give you. The word in the Greek in the habitation is okaterion. It only occurs twice in the New Testament. Here in Jude and, it, uh, and in 2 Corinthians 5 2. What does this word okaterion mean? It means habitation, like a habit or a habitation. Well, it's used in a only twice in the Bible. In Jude 6, we just read, it's what these angels left. These angels left their habitation. Here it says, it's in a positive sense, it's speaking of the believer. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our, and the same word, okaterion, which is from heaven. When we put this together, the angels that sinned shed the, 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 the place they were living in, the body they were living in, in order to participate in this sin with human beings. That term is the body that you and I aspire to. We would use the term resurrection body. See, for in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our habit or habitation, house, which is from heaven. You and I as believers aspire to having that heaven of Okaterian which is given to us by God. It's our immortal bodies. But that term is what these angels shed in order to participate in this mischief in Genesis 6. Let's look at another place. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. Peter makes a reference to the same thing again. He says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to Tartarus, I'll come back to that word, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah. And then he goes on. So Peter does two things here. He introduces to a word Tartarus, I'll come back to. But he also links these angels that sinned with the days of Noah. See, so God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down, delivered them in the chains of darkness, reserved on judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah. And he goes on to talk about Noah and the ark and all that business. Now, he uses the word Tartarus. That word does not occur anywhere else in the Bible. It's translated hell in your English Bible. But what kind of a hell is it? The word Tartarus in the Greek is widely used in Greek, not in biblical Greek, but in Greek. Tartarus is the Greek term for a dark abode of woe. In fact, it's considered the pit of darkness in the unseen world. Um, in Homer's Iliad, that classic uh, Greek thing, it is rendered as, it is as far below Hades as the earth is below heaven. What does that mean? I don't know, but I don't want to go there. Okay. Now, it's very possible that it might be synonymous with the abuso. That's speculation. We're not sure. We'll see. But that's another story. Now, what's interesting about this weird view that I'm sharing with you about Genesis 6, we'll discover that it, that same idea is embodied in the myths and legends of every culture, ancient culture on the planet Earth. 
Let's, we're best known as the, the Greek Titans. The Greek mythology t speaks of these demigods that are partly terrestrial, partly celestial. They apparently rebelled against their father Uranus. And after a prolonged contest, they were defeated by Zeus and condemned into Tartarus. Again, that's where the word comes from. And uh, by the way, it's interesting that Zeus is not the creator. I've been doing a little study in Greek mythology. I'm fascinated. You know, I always thought, well, Zeus is their name for God. Not exactly, because Zeus is still not the creator. So it's interesting. They don't reach that far in, in their thing. Anyway, here's pictures as, as Zeus is often rendered, who is the, they're, you know, they're the, the top guru here. And then you have Hercules. You all read, heard about Hercules. You all heard about Atlas. In the Greek mythology, these would be in the Hebrew called Nephilim. They were offspring of human mothers and, 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 uh, and, and, and uh, Greek myth mythological gods as parents. Now, if you study ancient legends, you'll discover the ancient, most earliest culture, Sumer has these legends, Assyria, Egypt, Incas, Mayan, Gilgam uh, Gilgamesh in Babylon, uh, Persia, Greece, of course. Most of us are familiar with the Greek versions of this mythology. India, Bolivia, South Sea, even the American Indians speak of the star people that came down and so forth. And uh, there, I came across a fascinating reference in a book that was considered at the time very reliable, the autobiography of William Cody, commonly known as Buffalo Bill. And if you look at Buffalo Bill's autobiography, Colonel William F. Cody in 1920, there's a paragraph, I put part of it in here. He says, while we were in the Sand Hills scouting the Neobarra country, the Pawnee Indians brought into camp some very large bones, one of which the surgeon of the expedition pronounced to be the thigh bone of a human being. The Indians said the bones were those of a race of people who long ago had lived in that country. They said these people were three times the size of a man of the present day, and they were so swift and strong that they could run by the side of a buffalo and taking the animal in one arm could tear off a leg and eat it as they ran. The bone was too big, they didn't have wagons, so they didn't keep it. So they, he recorded it in his journal. So I don't know what to make of that, but I think it's interesting. You'll discover if you study Indian lore that the Indians were terrified of the six-fingered people. That's why when they met a stranger, they held up the hand to prove they only had five fingers. This how business is Hollywood, but the, the idea of greeting a stranger with your hand so he could count fingers. You'll find that recorded in the pictographs in, uh, pictographs in uh, uh, Chaca, New Mexico, among other places. Anyway, moving on. There is a book that I, uh, that I have a extensive library, but uh, someone was kind enough to add this to it, by Stephen Quayle, which is an encyclopedia of giants, all relating to Genesis 6 and other subjects. And uh, this came out in 2002. I'm just giving you a couple of snapshots. It's amazing. He has a catalog here of hundreds of giants in human history that we have records of or pictures of. Here's a couple of guys. You wouldn't want to meet them in a dark alley, would you? Um, <laughs> Uh, here's a guy nine foot, uh, nine foot four inches, Machnoff uh, and uh, Chiquita. Two, uh, two of these are, of course, used in, in shows and stuff back in the uh, you know, turn of the century. Uh, here's a gal by the name of Lady Ama. She's two, 20 years, 22 years old, seven foot nine inches, with two elder sisters. You notice this, the, the one of them is very, is very small. She ends up uh, marrying a Chinese dwarf. These are from the late 19th century. Here's Captain Martin Van Buren and his wife, Mrs. Ann Bates. Uh, both of them about eight feet tall. She was actually a little taller than he was, or very close to it. He was born in Kentucky in 1847, and they, of course, uh, were on ex exhibit throughout Europe, but these uh, pictures were part of the promotion and so forth. Um, I, I could go on and on, but uh, just to give you some, there, the, 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 there are records of giant people, 10, 13 feet kinds of people, and, and skeletons, hundreds of them. It's a st one part of Stephen Quayle's book highlights the fact that for strange reasons, they always get covered up. You really have to do some digging to get the records and stuff. He spent 30 years pulling, the, pulling his encyclopedia together. But uh, there's a genetic discovery I want to share with you. Scientists at Johns Hopkins University have discovered that there's a gene in mice which controls growth. It's called GDF8. In other words, growth differentiation factor 8. Disrupting GDF8 will result in super mice that are two to three times larger and much stronger than normal mice. And this was published in Nature, a reputable journal, in April 30th of 1997. So it's interesting to me, don't confuse hormonal growth. Some people are large because of hormones, but they, when they get bigger, they get weaker. 
We're talking about a genetic difference here, and also, I'm assuming, a genetic difference in the Nephilim. You follow me? Because the Nephilim become supermen, very large and, uh, and very terrifying. And uh, so now it's interesting, by the way, speaking of genetics here now, it's interesting, in the Bible, there's the death penalty for lying with a beast, sleeping with an animal in the, in the sexual sense. If a woman lies with a beast, both shall be killed, not only the beast but the woman. That's in Leviticus 20, verses 15 and 16. I'll give you an example. This, see, this all deals with confusion. And one of the questions we can ponder as we drive home tonight, does the genetic transfers of human DNA into animals suggest that we are entering the period which Jesus likened to the days of Noah? This genetic thing is, you know, is, is going to get more complicated especially as we cross species lines. We're introducing confusion. We're going to open the door for diseases that we have no answer to and so forth. And so we're entering a, a very nightmarish era. And that's exactly what Revelation talks about in terms of, of uh, Revelation chapter 6 and so on. Well, it's interesting. As you travel the ancient world, you find these gods or super gods modeled in all the ancient writings. They have the flying god Ashur. <clears throat> and this guy shows up everywhere, on, on pyramids, on walls. Uh, as you go through Egypt, he's on all the thresholds. Um, as you go up there, you'll see, you see, you see it right in the middle of the, 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 these winged things. And, of course, some people feel that these may be allusions to flying saucers and what have you. And so uh, we won't get into that here. We did publish a book called Alien Encounters, which deals with this and, and, and explores the possibility that it may have some r relationship to the... Uh, uh, in, increasing uh, occurrence of, of, uh, of uh, flying of UFOs and so on. But there is a different view. The view I'm going to show you now is the way this material is classically taught in most seminaries. And as a result, most pastors, I'll, I'll show you some exciting exceptions, but uh, I, I, I'm talking about conservative pastors, and I'm talking about the general uh, uh, run-of-the-mill run of pastors. They talk about Genesis 6 in terms of what's called the line of Seth, and the view is that the sons of God, that phrase, refers to Seth, the leadership of Seth. Seth, they, they paint this picture. Abel's been killed by Cain, right? Then there comes Seth. Well, Cain's the bad guy, Seth's the good guy, is the, is the, is the, is the, is the fabric they try to create. And the sons of God is a phrase, they, they argue, that refers to the Sethite leadership. By the way, there's not a scrap of biblical reference that supports this. This is just the way it's taught. The daughters of Adam really means the daughters of Cain. And the big mistake that was made, presumably, is that the Sethite leadership commingled with the daughters of Cain, and that was, that was supposed to be a no-no. And there's some problems with that. The sin this was a failure to maintain separation. There's a problem with this because separation isn't called for until chapter 11. They weren't told to keep, keep separate, by the way. So this, this is all very contrived. But even when you go through this, the other question is, well, then, fine, if you got believers and unbelievers marrying, who are these Nephilim? When a believer and an unbeliever get married and have children, the children turn out to be monsters, but they're not monstrous. <laughs> they're not genetically distinctive. You with me? You, you see the difference? These Nephilim are genetically distinctive. And uh, this whole idea of the line of Seth emerged in the 5th century. Celsus and Julian the Apostate used the traditional belief in, you know, of the angel view of Genesis 6 to attack Christianity because it's a weird idea. A lot of people rebel at this idea. Angels having, you know, it's just unpleasant. So a guy by the name of Julius Africanus resorted to the Sethite theory as a more comfortable way with dealing with the text. He contrived this idea. Well, it, what it really means is this, you know. It doesn't mean what it says. It means that it's really referring to such and so. And, of course, then Cyril of Alexander used it to repudiate the orthodox position because it's leaning on Africanus. But the real mistake came when Augustine embraced the Sethite view, and because he did, and because of his stature, it became the orthodox view. The lines of Seth is the view that's, even to this day, still taught about this passage. And uh, this, thus it became part of the Catholic Church, and it prevailed through the Middle Ages. And most Protestant or denominations that derived from the Reformation kept, they, they dragged this baggage along without reexamining it. And uh, now, and so it's commonly taught today. When I'm teaching you here, you're going to have to, be, you're going to have to 
do some digging to, to even come across the, what's called the angel view of Genesis 6. But the text itself, the sons of God is never used of believers in the Old Testament. That's what the Sethite view would require. Seth was not God. Cain was not Adam. These were daughters of Adam, not daughters of Cain, right? So forth. And there's no, there's no mention of daughters of Elohim. There's bar, sons of God, but there aren't daughters. Are there no daughters of Elohim? What, what's the point? And um, there's also some grammatical problems with that that I won't bore you with. That gets technical, so we'll move on. And uh, the lines were separated in Genesis 11. That's when that was imposed upon Isaac, not for Ishmael or anybody else, just on Isaac. All, by the way, if the Sethites were the good guys, right, that's the theory of the Seth view, why did they drown in the flood? You see, all flesh was corrupted according to Genesis 6, verse 12. So this idea of the Sethite view, as it's called, if you start examining it from a textual basis, falls apart, makes no sense. Now, the inferred godliness of Seth is suspect because who was his son? Remember, see, only Enoch and Noah's eight were spared. Noah and his three sons, that's four people, and their four wives. Eight people in that ark. Enoch's pulled out ahead of time. Those eight are miraculously preserved in the ark. But where are the Sethites if they're such good guys? Remember, these, the Nephilim took wives as they chose. And why did the Sethites perish in the flood? And by the way, something else you may recall from last session, Enosh, which was Seth's son, is the guy that initiated the defiance of God. He's the first apostate. That last verse in chapter 4 is mistranslated. In the days of Enosh, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. That's mistranslated. They began to defy, call upon idols and so forth. Very important translation issue we talked about last time. Men began to profane the name of the Lord according in Genesis 4.26. That's the Targum of Angelos, which is in the Jewish community regarded as the translation. The Targum of Jonathan. Kimchi, Rashi, and the other rabbinical scholars all agree. Jerome agrees. Maimonides, which is probably the most venerated of the Hebrew sages of the 12th century in his commentary on the Mishnah. The point is the ancient Hebrew uh, sages understood the angel view. That's the main point I'm getting here. And... Uh, Daughters of Cain is the concept. There's not a subset of the daughters of Adam. Canaanites were not necessarily godless. Remember, Cain, yes, he murdered his brother, but remember how that chapter, that chapter ends with his genealogy. He names his son with the name of God in it. He, be, he was a repentant believer. Yes, he did murder, and yes, he's suffering for it, but he, his children were God-fearing, apparently, at least some of them. And uh, the other question about the daughters of Seth that they don't have an answer for, were the daughters of Seth so unattractive? Why are the Sethite leadership going after daughters of Cain? What's wrong with the daughters of Seth? Are they ugly or what's the problem? Um, anyway, but the uh, unnatural offspring is the, is the final nail in the coffin of the Sethite thing. The, the, the supernatural offering, the, 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 the text implies that the offering, the Nephilim, were the mighty men, the Hagabarim. And, uh, and to give you an example of one is Goliath. He was a descendant of, of Anak. Anak was one of the Nephilim. And of course, this whole issue of uh, no ex. Uh, uh, chromosomes among the Sethites. There were no women of renown, men of renown, right? No women of renown. And so what made, and then the other question is, what made Noah's genealogy so distinctive that it gets a mention in verse 9? Because it was unblemished. These others were blemished. Now the New Testament, as I point out, confer, uh, uh, confirms this three times. In Jude 6 and 7, we looked at that. 1 Peter 3, 19 and 20, and 2 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5. So we went, we went through those. Now, the angel view before Christ was the, is all, all through the traditional rabbinical literature. It's in the book of Enoch, as I mentioned before. It's the testimony of the 12 patriarchs. It's in Joseph, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Josephus. Josephus talks, he's clearly, he, he, he takes for granted the angel view in his writings. And the Septuagint, as I mentioned. So if you look at the record that we would regard as useful, it uh, clearly, it knows no other view than really the angel view. The church fathers in the early church, Philo of Alexandria, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Athenagoras, Tertullian, Lactinius, and Am uh, Ambrose is missing, it should be Ambrose, and uh, Julian. Um, let's talk about modern day. If you read the writings of G.H. Pember, M.R.D. Hahn, C.H. McIntosh, Dillich, Kyle and Dillich are the authoritative commentaries in the Old Testament in most uh, th seminary libraries. Um, Gabelian, Arthur W. Pink, Donald Gray Barnhouse, Henry Morris down in San Diego, Merrill Unger, expert on demonology, 
Arnold Fruchtenbaum, one of the greatest contemporary Jewish scholars on the, knows his Bible, and Hal Lindsey, Chuck Smith. I had a guy that didn't really buy this, a good friend of mine, this guy by the name of Tim LaHaye. And uh, Tim and I used to have some discussions, and he, would, he wouldn't fight me on it. He just couldn't quite. I got a letter from him just a couple days ago. It was, uh, the subject of the letter was some other things congratulating us on the, the, the verdict that we got in that trial and so forth. But, uh, but he also, in a letter, says, Chuck, you finally convinced me. Because he's apparently, for some other reasons, he's doing some research and some writing, and he's got all our tapes. He's gone through them three times. And he, he, he finally, in his letter, he says, you finally convinced me on the, on the angels of Genesis 6. And so I could add his name here, too, I suppose. But uh, anyway. So the Sethite view is, is shattered by the text itself, by the inferred separation, by the inferred godliness of Sethites, the inferred Cainite subset of the Adamites, the unnatural offspring called Nephilim, New Testament confirmations. But here is the real shocker to me. Up till now, that was my view. But as I've doing, been doing some homework in recent years, I also realized you will not understand what happened after the flood and most of the prophecies through the Old Testament unless you understand this background. If you miss this, uh, so I always felt, well, okay, there's two different views. I hold this one, they hold that one. Who cares? Let's go on. I discovered, no, this turns out to be important foundation to understand the rest of the Old Testament because you're going to run into in the Old Testament a term called the Rephaim. The word Repha means dead. It also means, um, uh, it can mean um, uh, 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 ghost or spirit, but it's often the referent are the dead ones. But see, they're not; they're the walking dead. You'll discover in Genesis six four when we talked about the Nephilim. It says, and also after that, after the flood, we run into people called the Rephaim. Now, one of the questions that lurks behind this study will be, who built the ancient monuments? You know, the world is littered with monuments that defy explanation, not just the Great Pyramid and Stonehenge. There are palaces and things and temples in which the rocks are the size of boxcars. And they come from hundreds of miles away. And there's all kinds of theories, but the truth is no one really knows how these things were built. And this doesn't explain it, but it begins to, there's a hint that there's, see the Great Pyramid of Giza is one, the Stonehenge in Britain. And there's a circle of, ref, of what's known as a circle of Rephaim up in the Golan Heights. Nan and I were up there once. We got a four by four, and we went up there. And uh, 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 the, uh, the, we, you can, this is an aerial. You can't tell this from the ground. When you're in the air, you realize it's a stonehenge type structure. It's called the Gilgal Rephaim. It's up in the Golan Heights, up near Bashan. And we're going to talk more about that as we go. Um, there are five circles that involve 20-ton stones. The diameter is about 155 meters. It's dated to about 3000 BC. It's built on a flat plateau. It's only visible, you can only tell its architecture from getting above it. And uh, it's about 10 miles from Ashtaroth, Karnim, and it's in Genesis, Joshua. We won't spend a lot of time on that here. There's some other ruins. These have never been excavated, by the way, because they're up there in this, in this, in, up in the Golan, where it's, it's, it's the tension. When we take some pictures, there were shells dropping about 1,000 yards away. Um, training, training stuff, but still. After the flood, it says, also after that, we discover. You'll be introduced in Genesis 14. There's at least four tribes, the Rephaim, the Emim, the Horim, and the Zamzumim, that God instructs Joshua to wipe out every man, woman, and child of those certain tribes. When you read that in the Old Testament, as a New Testament reader, you, you, it's hard to relate to that because they are instructed not to compromise, to wipe out every man, woman, and child. And you, need to understand, you won't understand that unless you realize there's a gene pool problem. When we get to Genesis 15... God is going to give Abraham, Genesis 12, 15, and 17, deals with God's covenant with Abraham where he commits the land to Abraham. And he tells Abraham what's going to happen. You're going to go away and your descendants will come back here after 400 years. He goes through that prophecy. Well, when God tells Abraham that, Satan suddenly knows that he's got four centuries to lay down a minefield. And so the mischief that led to the the the, the flood of Noah that was worldwide which was taken care of by the flood that same mischief apparently was, in, it was indulged in in the land of Canaan to provide these giants to prevent Israel from taking its possession Satan has always tried to oppose God's plan and he gave that land to Israel so in those days he had these giants today he's got the PLO and the UN 
but let's move on. In Numbers 13, you remember when Moses sent the 12 spies out and two, Joshua and Caleb back, said, let's go get them. God's with us. But the other 10 were terrified. They said, we are as grasshoppers in their sight. Why? Verse 13, uh, verse 33 of Numbers 13, there were Nephilim in the land. That actual Hebrew word is used there. And uh, Arba, Anak, and his seven sons were known as the sons of Anak, or the Anakim. Uh, they were encountered in Canaan. Their descendants, you will remember, one had a group of brothers. His name was Goliath, right? Uh, uh, and so on. So um, these guys are 10, 13 feet tall. These are, these are not just overgrown. These aren't basketball guys. These are different breed altogether. There was a king, Og, the king of Bashan. Up in the Golan Heights, the biblical area is called Bashan. And Og, the king of Bashan, is known in Deuteronomy 3 and Joshua 12 and elsewhere as the king of the giants. He was the king of these gigantic races that were derivative from some kind of undisclosed mischief by these angels again, uh, uh, Satan's uh, uh, emissaries. And Goliath and his four brothers. See, when you read all about David, and he goes when he's, as a kid, he's going to take on Goliath. Notice when he stops at that brook, he picks up five stones. How many did he need for Goliath? One. What are the other, the other four there, lack of faith? No. He was ready for all of them. Give your whole insight to this kid. You can study the Bible from cover to cover in terms of Satan's strategy to try to thwart the plan of God. As, as God reveals that there's going to be a redeemer, a seed of the woman, Satan knew he had to deal with the human race. The corruption of Adam's line was his first shot, apparently. Well, maybe, maybe Cain and Abel was part of it, but by corrupting the firstborn there. Abraham's seed, when, when God starts to tell, tell Abraham, that calls Abraham and tells him it's, the Redeemer is going to come from his seed, then Abraham, it allows Satan to focus his attack now, not on everybody, just on Abraham. The famine, famine in Genesis 50 and others. When you get to Exodus, the destruction of the male line by Pharaoh is all part of Satan's provocation. Even after Pharaoh lets him go on Passover, he changes his mind, goes after him, right? To what? To wipe them out. Pharaoh's pursuit in Exodus 4, 14. And then, of course, the whole population of Canaan, to prevent them from getting in there, is, is part of what we're going to be dealing with here. When God finally reveals that it's going to be not just through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and through the tribe of Judah, even at time God does, it allows Satan to focus. But when he reveals that it's going to be out of the house of David, that allow, in 2 Samuel 7, that allows Satan to focus his attacks on the house of David. And in the royal line, again and again and again, we find the royal kids, the heirs to the throne, are killed. There's an attempt to wipe out all the heirs, except always there's a servant that hides a baby. There's all kinds of these, all through the, there are these intrigues. The Arabians slew all but Hezariah, who was hidden. Athalia, she ends up killing everybody, but Joash escapes. Hezekiah is assaulted in Isaiah 36 and 38. Remember, when you get to the Persian Empire. Haman is trying to wipe out the entire Jewish race. Why? Well, it's prejudice. No, it's more, more, something more deeper than not, not just that simple. It's an attempt to thwart the plan of God. And you wonder, why is Satan still at it today? Because there's a prerequisite condition for the second coming of Christ. That's for Israel to repent and to ask him to return. And they will. But it'll take the tribulation to drive them to it. In, uh, in the New Testament, Joseph fears when Mary's pregnant. That was punishable by death. She's feared, he fears for her. Matthew 1. Herod's attempt to killing the babes at Bethlehem. We celebrate every Christmas that comes up. That's Satan's attempt to thwart the plan of God. At Nazareth, in, 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 when Jesus opens his ministry in Luke 4, they try to throw him off a cliff. Then there's storms at sea. And by the way, there's two of them, not just one. In Mark 4 and Luke 8, you'll discover if you study those storms, they were not, in my opinion, natural storms. Why? Because there were sailors aboard that are familiar with those waters that knew about storms, and they were terrified. That tells me something else is going on. They were supernaturally induced, I believe. And that's why Jesus rebukes the storm. Interesting. You check the words. And, of course, the ultimate strategy was the cross. And all of this is summarized for you in Revelation 12. In Revelation, it's got this dramatic book, but there's a chapter set aside, chapter 12, where it reviews from the seed of the woman until the rapture.
In fact, beyond the rapture. So Satan's still at it. He's not through. What does the Galan Heights, Hebron, and the Gaza Strip have in common? You read those in the news lately? They were the areas that Joshua failed to exterminate the Rephaim in Joshua 15 and so forth. If you do a study of the book of Judges, the strongholds that failed to defeat Israel completely in the book of Judges are the parts that are colored on the map. Those are the territories that to this day are still remaining in dispute. And where's their capital? In Jericho, Bet Yaral, the house of the moon god. Interesting, isn't it? Isn't that fascinating? I think it's interesting. Then tell me demons are not territorial. <laughs> there is a very, very strange verse in Psalm 22. All of us read Psalm 22. It sounds as if it was dictated, first person singular, by Jesus as he hung on the cross. It opens up with, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And it closes closes with it, it's done, it's finished. And, uh, but in the middle, and we always look at that with great, it, it's incredible uh, as you go through that. But right in the middle of it, there is a strange verse in verse 12. Jesus apparently saying, many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. Now Bashan is what we call the Golan Heights, and it was well known as cattle raising country. Bulls of Bashan was an idiom. It may be that's what he means. A bunch of cattle down there? I don't think so. I suspect, don't know this, I'm just guessing here, but I suspect this is a demonic phrase. That the bulls of Bashan is referring to something supernatural. And there's another issue that surprises me that more experts, people who have really specialized in this field, have not seen the discernment. And that's the distinction between fallen angels and demons. All through the Bible we find fallen angels. We just talked a lot about them so far today. When you get the New Testament, you run into these strange things that we generally call demons. Are they equivalent or are they distinctive? There are experts, Merrill Unger being one of them, that are really, that's their world, is demonology, that don't make the distinction I'm going to suggest to you here, so you have to decide for yourself. The nature of angels. What do we know about angels? We'll go through the Bible and discover they always appear in human form. They never look like anything. They don't look like lizards or elephants. They, they, they normally look like they're in human form. It's Sodom and Gomorrah. They're, they're always in pairs, too, usually, by the way. Sodom and Gomorrah, remember? At the resurrection, they were there, a couple of them. At the ascension, there's a couple of them, right? Always looked like men, right? They spoke so you could understand them. They took men by the hand. They ate meals with them, right? Paul even admonishes you in his New Testament epistles to, in terms of hospitality. Many of you have entertained angels unawares. That's Paul, so Paul's, that's Paul's perception there, okay? They are capable of direct physical combat. The Passover in Egypt was accomplished by an angel doing the Lord's bidding. Angel of death is referred to in some places. One night after dinner, one angel slaughters 185,000 Syrian soldiers. I don't know how many soldiers were there. It wouldn't surprise me if there were twice that many if they slid every other throat. That's what the Turks used to do, just to scare everybody to death. You wake up in the morning and find every other, you know, that's demoralizing to a group. Because um, the word gets around. See? But anyway, the slaughter of 185,000. You don't mess with angels. By the way, Jesus said they don't marry. That causes a lot of confusion. I'll come back to that. He says the angels in heaven don't marry. But angels are always referred to in the masculine. And you say, well, that's just a figure of speech. No. Study carefully Genesis 19. What the homosexuals of that city wanted Lot to deliver his guests. So they draft out. I don't have to get more graphic than that. Now, in contrast to these things, when we run into demons in the New Testament, they're very different. They seem to be powerless except to the extent they can indwell someone. They apparently always seek embodiment. That's why they petitioned to go into the swine and all that, at Gadara. You know the story. Jesus uh, said, for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God. He's referring to believers. When he, in the resurrection, they neither marry or are given in marriage, but are as angels of God in heaven. Meaning, what he means by that, is they are immortal. You don't, a, someone that is mortal needs to procreate. Someone that's immortal doesn't procreate. That's his point. Now, he doesn't say, he's talking about the angels that are in heaven, the ones that are well behaved. I personally would not put any limitations on the technology available to an angel that's bent on mischief. That's, the, that's my real point, I think. 
The word habitation, I've covered this before, the akaterion, refers to the body and it was a dwelling place for the spirit. It occurs only twice. In Jude 6, from which the angels disrobed, and in 2 Corinthians 5, 2, the heavenly body to which us, we as believers long to be clothed with. And I, 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 uh, the, the word habitation in, in one place is the same as the word house in the other place. Well, let's back up a little bit and talk about warfare. When we were in Genesis 3, verse 15, we had God declaring war on Satan. He said, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and he shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Everybody quotes this as the first, is the first link in the chain of prophecies about Jesus Christ, and that's where he gets the title, the seed of the woman. But many people miss that there's two seeds here. There's the seed of the woman, and there's the, the, uh, the, the seed of the serpent. He later is called the red dragon in Revelation 12. He's the coming world leader, I call him. I don't like the term Antichrist because it's, it's too limiting. And he's, uh, he has a sidekick by the name of the false prophet. So with Satan and the coming world political leader and the false prophet at his side, you've got a satanic counterfeit of a trinity. Everything Satan does is a counterfeit. And these are the forces behind the world today. And J Daniel chapter 10 is your recommended study on the details of all of that. When you get to Daniel 2, and Daniel, you, we, we have the four, the famous event of Daniel 2 is by way of review. We have Babylon, Persia, Greece, then Rome in two phases. In Daniel chapter 7, it's laid out, same subject, different idioms. But again, we have those same empires. But we get to these, in, in Daniel 2, we have the iron mixed with clay, remember? There's all this, all this speculation. We have, you know, the head we know is gold, is Babylon, the silver is Persia, the brass is green. The legs are iron, but the feet are iron mixed with clay. What on earth is the clay? And I've taught this for 30 years before I realized Daniel explains who the clay is. And of course, uh, the last two are iron, uh, two phases of the same empire. But... Uh, we know that we're heading for a world order, a world without borders. We talked about that a lot. Uh, the, the whole idea of, of, uh, of these things are, and it's, it's coming. Global government's happening for at least three reasons. The nuclear proliferation is part of it. You've got to have global governance. Uh, terrorism is a worldwide thing. It knows no borders. But there's also the possibility that we're going to be unified in a world government for a cosmic threat. General MacArthur said that. Reagan said it three times in public speeches. Many people missed that that one thing will unite this world will be a threat from the outside. But get back to this, what is the miry clay in Daniel 2? See, my, it's all in Aramaic, not Hebrew. From Daniel 2 to 7 is in, in the Gentile language of the day, the Aramaic, not the Hebrew. Miry clay is clay made from mire or dust. It's very brittle. When you get to Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, verse 43, I remember I must have read this hundreds of times over 30 years and never noticed what it said. Shame on me. And Daniel's interpreting this vision. He says, Whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Whoops. Wait a minute. What did he say? See, the they, it's a person. The clay represents some kind of people. They, it's miry clay. They, just switches to a personal pronoun, shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. In order to mingle with the seed of men, they have to be something other than the seed of men. Or does it's, I have, have had this checked by experts. That's what the Hebrew requires. Whatever they are, they're not the seed of men. What are they? I don't know. Are they Nephilim? Possibly. Are they genetically engineered clones? Possibly. But whatever they are, they apparently are a political constituency that is substantial in the scheme of things here. Whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with the miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of man, but they shall not cleave to one another, even as iron is not mixed with the, miry, with the clay. And he goes on. Mingle themselves with the seed of man. Interesting phrase. See, there is going to be restraint. We all know about the restrainer being removed. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now hindereth will hinder until he be taken out of the way, and then shall the wicked one be revealed. That's this we often call him the Antichrist, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power. Wow. All power and signs and lying wonders. Be prepared for this political leader to do miracles powered by Satan. We're not ready for that. Second Thessalonians 2 is where we're drawing from here. Where does the Antichrist come from? Everybody misses this. He's in Revelation 13. Wait a minute. In Revelation 11, he's where he's first introduced in Revelation. Verse 7. 
And when they shall have finished, speaking of the two witnesses, when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. That's, of course, the Antichrist finally kills two witnesses. Where does he come out of? Out of the abuso. In Revelation 17, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life and it goes on. Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved for this cause God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Not a lie, the lie. Well, I, I want to just close with, uh, get, then we'll get back to finishing up the last few verses of the chapter. We've done all this in the first four verses. I appreciate that. But what I want you to do tonight, when you get some time, I want you to read the second psalm, and I want you to diagram who's speaking. There are three people talking to each other. The psalm reads, it opens up as follows. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying... Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. And he goes on. If you diagram this, you'll discover it's a, it's a discussion among the Trinity. Part of this is the Father, part of the Son, part of the Holy Spirit. And we take that little short psalm, diagram it, and figure out who's saying what to whom. But this is talking about what I consider the most absurd war imaginable. All wars are bad, of course. Some are justified, some aren't. But the most ridiculous war is this one that it's talking about. I can understand people not believing in God. I can understand people uh, being disobedient to God. What I cannot imagine in my mind is the world knowingly taking up arms against God. But that's what's going to happen. Why do the heathen rage of the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against who? Against the Lord and his anointed. That's what the word Christ means. It's anointed one. It's saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords. They're going to throw off the shackles of God? Really? The rest of the psalm deals with it. I'll let you, I invite you to go take a look at it. Well, let's get back to finish up the chapter. The rest of the go is, God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was evil, only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And uh, this, of course, the word is uh, in, in repented is nacham, which is a, a knifeful form, which describes anthropologically as God having suffered a heart-rendering disappointment. Literally, it speaks of taking a deep breath in extreme pain. That's what it really means. So he said God can't repent. He, you know, we use that word in a different sense. It's, it's an anthropomorphism to how God felt. He was, God was hurt. It grieved him at his heart. The Lord said, I will destroy man from for, uh, whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But, oh, important word, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Boy, are we grateful for that. Every one of us are a descendant of Noah. Did you know that? Of course, yeah, okay. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. And uh, perfect really means upright, if you will. But again, we talked about that. Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was uh, corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. By the way, that verse also shreds the Sethite theory. No good guys. No one deserving. Genesis 13, God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. Now the word ark here is tiba. Uh, it came down from the Latin arca is where we get the word ark. It's a chest or coffer. The word for ark and the ark of the covenant is a different word in the Hebrew. But obviously it's what you and I would properly call a barge. It's not a boat. It's not powered. It's just a barge. But, but anyway, what's, and it's, by the way, it's been studied like mad by naval architects. And the, 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 the proportions are ideal, it turns out, strangely. I want you to notice now, and we'll talk about it more next time, thou shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. 
If you make a boat, where do you pitch the boat? Where do you make the? Where do you put the waterproofing? Yeah, but this is on both sides, isn't it? Why do you suppose that's pitched within and without? I'm going to suggest to you, and we'll develop it next time as we get into the ark itself, that it's designed to preserve it. That ark, I believe, has been miraculously hidden, and it may be on the verge of being discovered. I don't think it's in what we call Mount Ararat. It's somewhere else, but that's, that's another. We'll talk about that next time. But the point is, it's designed to be preserved because I believe it's going to be discovered and it's going to serve as a testimony to an unbelieving world of the coming judgment. Again, not a flood this time, but um, we'll see. God goes on to give him more details. He says, this is the fashion which thou shalt make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. For our purposes here, assume that a cubit is about 18 inches. It could be as large as 25 inches, but let's just, we, a foot and a half is an easy approximation for us. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. And a window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shall be set in the side thereof, with the lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. Don't picture a little square window. Picture a slot like a transom across the whole length of it. You follow me? To let air, light in and air and so forth. That's the way it's generally rendered by most people who have studied this. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. And with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. And of every living thing, of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee, they shall be male and female. Of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall, shall come unto thee and keep them alive. Now we're going to discover the first two verses of the next chapter is going to mend that with an addition. Because he's going to add 14. Because, he's actually going to add a dozen more because you can take the two and add seven of each. There's going to be seven, seven of each, seven male, seven female. You with me? For, for of those that are clean. We'll talk about that next time. And thou shalt take unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. That sounds so glib. Can you imagine building something the size that's larger of the Titanic in your front driveway and spend 120 years of having your neighbors make fun of you. They didn't know what rain was. There was no such thing as rain in those days. We forget that. There was no rain. Rain came later. We'll take a quick look at the chapter 7 and we'll tie it off here tonight. The Lord said unto Noah, this is the opening of the next chapter, Come thou in all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast shalt thou take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. Of fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of the earth. The question you're going to examine between now and next week is how did Noah know what was clean and unclean? Those are definitions that don't show up until Moses under the law, which is generations later, right? So next time, we're talking about the flood of Noah. Was it local or was it really worldwide? Big debate. There are guys like Hugh Ross and others that don't believe in a, in a universal flood. They claim to be Bible believers, but they have some word games they play. But they, there are people, anyway, there are people that don't believe it was a worldwide flood. I'll explain what we think and why when it comes. Was the ark big enough to hold all the animals required? We'll talk about that. But more importantly, perhaps, how is the ark relevant prophetically? God puts it on one of the highest mountains, so high in altitude they have to leave it there. It's too thin to live. So when they leave the ark, they go down. They can't cannibalize it to make cabins and stuff. It's on top of, what, 14,000 feet or wherever it is. Um, I'm going to suggest that it has another role, yet future. 
I want you for next time to read chapters 7, 8, and 9 because we'll try to take all three to make up a little for the time I took to hammer home this one. Um, the angel view of Genesis 6. I'm, I'm trying to emphasize it only because you're going to discover that it, its understanding will be essential to understand what really happened in the book of Joshua, what really happened uh, all through the scripture, and what Isaiah means when he talks about the Rephaim that they're not eligible for resurrection and so forth. There's all, it, it, it pervades the whole scripture. And especially you have no ability to understand what Jesus meant when he says, as the days of Noah were, so shall the days of the coming of the Son of Man be. What on earth did he mean? Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we do praise you. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you that you've seen fit to reveal to us not only what you've done, but what you're going to do. We thank you, Father, for your precious, precious word. We do pray, Father, that you would open our hearts and lives to your word. We pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit, you would instruct us, you'd highlight to us that which you'd have us carry away from these passages. But above all, Father, we would ask that you would reignite in each of us a new hunger, a new passion for your word, that we each might continue to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, that we each might be more fruitful stewards of the opportunities that are before us. We thank you, Father, as we commit ourselves into your hands without any reservation. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.